We are uh, studying the book of Genesis together, and we've come to the point where we're just leaving the primordial history behind. Um, and a few questions have been answered, if you've noticed, uh, questions you might not have even thought to ask. We're told. We're, we're told where marriages come from. Uh, we, we've been told the origin of metalworking and music and all sort of things. We, we've told, been told how we got the various nationalities and ethnicities that there are and how they got scattered all over the world. And we've covered an enormous amount of time, really, in the space of those 11 chapters, uh, whether we can calculate exactly how much from the genealogies, I don't know. Um, personally, I, I think you probably can, as you'll find out, figure out in my comments this morning. But am I sure? I'd call it more confidence than certainty. But as we move into chapter 12, we transition from this global perspective to focus on one individual and his family. And through the rest of the book, we'll be, uh, we'll be tracing the journey of faith taken by our, the fathers of our faith. And sometimes we'll be shocked at their behavior. Um, but we will see ourselves in them too. And, and we're supposed to, you know, if you believe, then you are a child of Abraham, the father of all who believe. But, you know, already in this primeval history that we've seen, uh, that we've been looking at, we've seen the movement from creation to corruption to destruction. And yet every time we see God execute his judgment, we also see him exhibit his grace. You know, the, the ground was cursed because of, of Adam, and uh, childbirth would be painful because of Eve's sin. And Adam and Eve and every husband and wife from then on would struggle to get along. But one day, a child of the woman would come and crush the head of the seed of the serpent, and undo the devil's works. And then when Cain murdered Abel, you, yes, he was cursed. He was the first human being to be cursed by God. But he was also graciously marked by God so that no one would kill him. And then God graciously provided Seth after the loss of Abel. And, and we, we noted that Noah... You know, God judges the world, and yet he preserves Noah. And we noted that Noah presents a great model for us for where we all are in terms of redemptive history, where we are in the great story. You know, just as in his day he proclaimed that he had a message from God that the world was coming to an end, and that always gives the opportunity for repentance. So too, we have a very clear message from God. Judgment is coming. Jesus, who lived to show us the Father and to show us how to live before Him and actually to live that way before Him because we couldn't, but to do it for us that we might have His righteous record given to us, just as surely as we got our sinfulness in Adam, we can have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, yes, we're moving into a more recognizable world as we, as we move on past chapter 11. But we've already seen that whole pattern of redemption. We're in chapter 11 of Genesis. We're picking up just after the Tower of Babel incident. If you have a copy of the Scriptures with you, you might want to... Uh, open to Genesis chapter 11, you may remember that we were given a, uh, a genealogy in chapter 10. All the sons of Noah, you know, and their descendants, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and we were told how, how they, all their children spread out through the whole world, and, and we were, then we were told how that came about with that story of the Tower of Babel. 
And now Moses, having told us about Babel, he, he now picks that genealogy back up again with Shem. But wait a minute, hasn't he already given us a genealogy of Shem? Yes, he has. Um, but if you recall, uh, he, he skipped someone. So let's, uh, let's read it together. We'll take the genealogy first, and then we'll, we'll turn to the call of, of Abram. Beginning in verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arphaxad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arphaxad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, in the previous gene genealogy, we weren't told about Peleg's children. So this is where Moses is picking up. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru. And Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans, and Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, we have a few head scratchers here. Um, until you get to verse 27, there's not really a whole lot to say. Uh, the, the declining la lifespans is, is obvious and kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, the, the whole story uh, so far has been about the corrupting influence upon, of sin upon society and, and God's determination to be gracious and dis to destroy the works of the devil. So I don't think it's... It's really surprising that we see this, uh, the lifespans uh, drop into a range we're familiar with. But we're not really given an explanation. We're, it's just sort of a record that it happened. And, and to be honest, I, I'd love to skip the, the, this genealogy entirely and move right on to the, uh, the call of Abram. And I would except that there are some, some real difficulties with this passage, with the genealogy itself. And, and I hate to get into the weeds with this kind of thing, but we kind of have to this morning. Uh, I don't want you to be surprised one day uh, by something you'd never noticed before. And in this passage, we'll find a couple of things that are difficult to work through. Hold your finger here, uh, or if there's two of you, one of you stay here, and the other of you turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 34. Luke's giving us the lineage of Jesus Christ, his genealogy. And when he gets to the patriarchs, verse 34, he tells us he is the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg. Okay, now start comparing. Who was Peleg's dad? 
Eber was. That's verse 16, Genesis 11. Who was Eber's dad? Sheila was. So far, so good. Now, who was Sheila's dad? Luke tells us that it was Hinan. But in Genesis 11, 12, it's Arphachad. Luke says that Arphachad was Hinan's dad, not Sheila's. What gives? Well, this is where I say we're going to get into the weeds, and I apologize, but we just have to. Luke is quoting from the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. In fact, most of the time when New Testament authors quote from the Bible, they're quoting the Septuagint, and it makes sense. They're writing in Greek, so they use a Greek translation. So you need to appreciate, as we go into this question, you need to appreciate the value that the Septuagint has as an, or is as an ancient witness of the Hebrew text of the Bible. Uh, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, most of our manuscripts were medieval. That was the oldest manuscripts we had was medieval. Um, Septuagint was translated in the second century before Christ. So it's very old. Uh, older than our earliest Hebrew manuscripts on Genesis 11. So I believe that the guys who translated uh, the, the Hebrew text in Greek um, had manuscripts that were slightly different than the Hebrew manuscripts that have been preserved for us. And I'm going to suggest it is not a hill that I would die on, uh, but I'm going to suggest that Septuagint actually preserves a better reading for us than our Masoretic text does, and that's what we translate from our Old Testament from. Um, now, you could say... Hey, genealogies are often selected. They might Moses skip what Luke included. Big deal. But you know, when genealogies are, when they do skip people, when they're organized uh, differently, they're organized theologically, and there's a reason. Like when you see Matthew structure uh, three sets of fourteen generations, they, he structures redemptive history that way. Uh, and also, when they structure them. That way, they don't include numbers that carefully link one to the other without any gaps. This one does. So I'm inclined to believe that this is one of the rare places where a better reading is actually preserved for us in the Greek translation. Now, does that mean that I cannot trust my Old Testament? No. No. In fact, I want you to appreciate this. Before we had the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest manuscript we had of Isaiah was an 8th century manuscript. So when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and found a copy of Isaiah that's 250 B.C., that moves the date back a thousand years. And critical thought scholars were really expecting to have a lot of differences between those two texts. They are virtually identical. Nevertheless, I think that the Septuagint is better here, and not only here, but at another place in our passage. If you do the math on the names here, you'll find that Shem outlives Abram, and that Abram could have known Noah. And maybe that's the way it was. Um, I, I don't suppose that would really be shocking. I mean, uh, what an amazing living cultural memory of the flood that would be. But I don't actually think that's the case. For years, I have been bothered, mildly bothered, but bothered by the fact that it, the Egyptian records, Egyptian chronology, which is very well preserved, doesn't line up with the biblical chronology. And uh, look, I, I don't wait for confirmation from secular sources before I believe the Bible. Let God be true, though, every man a liar. I'll believe the Bible over the Egyptian sources. Uh, but I do like things to line up. And I've always been a little bothered by the fact that they didn't. But the solution 
is probably found in a conspiracy. <laughs> you see, if you look at the Septuagint version of the passage, all of these people live longer, much longer. Instead of living 30 years and fathering Ru, Peleg lives 130 years and then fathers Ru. In fact, every one of these people was a hundred extra years before having their child, except for Nahor, for some reason, he only given an extra 50 years. Now, how is that a conspiracy? Well, the best explanation that I have found for this is that the Jewish scribes deliberately shortened these dates for a very specific reason. They were expecting the Messiah to come in the sixth millennium. They absolutely refused to see Jesus Christ as that Messiah. And so they altered these dates, putting Jesus in the fifth millennium so that they could maintain their expectation. Come on. you got to be kidding me. you got to be making this stuff up, Clark. I'm not. Here's the deal. The oldest manuscript for the, for the passage that we're reading this morning, the oldest Hebrew manuscript for that, it's only a thousand years old. But Josephus, who's a who's a Hebrew, I'm sorry, a Jewish historian writing in Greek in con, pretty much contemporary with Jesus Christ, when he cites this passage, he uses the Septuagint's dates. He knows Hebrew. And if you do shift those numbers back to where I think they belong, everything lines up remarkably well with the secular sources. Again, let God be true and every man a liar. I, don't, I, I believe the Bible come what may. But I sure do like things for, for things to line up. And if you add those 780 years back in, they did. So that's a hard, that's a hard thing, isn't it? And, and I'm not sure what to do with that. I've given you my estimation uh, of the situation. Uh, I believe the Bible. I believe God has preserved his word. So how do I reckon with this? I don't know. It, it's a hard one. But I, I've done the best with scholarship to tell you what I think about that genealogy. So we're introduced to the main characters of our story in verse 27. Terah had three sons. He also had a daughter. Um, that one of his sons married, and that son was Abram. That means that Abram married his half-sister. Yuck. You know, I've, I've heard two takes on this. Either it's more, you know, it's one more example that God was gracious to Abraham. I mean, look at his family. It's incestuous and all of that. Or... You know, that law hasn't been established one day. God, God's going to say that this is too close to Mary, uh, but apparently it's okay here. Um, it, I don't know which it is. It's certainly going to come up in the story, so maybe we'll discover it as we go. But uh, Abram's brother Nahor, he marries his dead brother's wife. Now, that's another tradition that we might find very strange. Um, marrying a deceased relative's wife so, so that you could provide an inheritance by giving children that he didn't otherwise have because he died. Um, we're going to deal with that custom very, very extensively in chapter 38, so I'm going to leave that alone for now. Um, by the way, that will be a lesson where uh, you, you, I'll give you a heads up that you might not have your children in for that one in Genesis 38. But they, uh, they come to the, the grandparents. Uh, they, these people become the grandparents of Rebecca. So, and we're also introduced a lot here in our passage. Uh, Abram's nephew, his dead brother's son. Uh, you'll notice that they, they set out for Canaan even before God calls Abram. Once again, I'll just tell you that it's there. I don't know what to do with that, really. Um, did God... Did, did, did uh, Terah follow Abram's call? Did God call Abram and Terah say, okay, let's go, and then change his mind in Terry and Haran? I don't know. Was it Terah's idea to go to Canaan, and then God just springboarded off of that? I don't know. But 
they leave Ur, they strike out toward Canaan, and they tarry in Haran. They don't get any further. In fact, Terah's name means tarry or delay, and they get no further. Terah dies. And the only other thing to draw your attention to before we get to God's call to Abram is found in verse 30. Sarai was barren. She had no child. That's going to be a focal point of the narrative moving forward. In fact, all of the, the patriarchs, Lives struggled with this very issue. So that's where Abram is as we open chapter 12. Let's, uh, let's read the first three verses this morning. Now the, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice what God says here. I will, I will, I will. I'll show you a land. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who dishonor you. You appreciate that these, God is doing, God is saying, I will do. He's saying, I will do the very things that sinful mankind sought to do for themselves at Babel. They chose the land. They wanted to make a name for themselves that they might be a great nation. They saw, they saw something in that power, safety, control over the heavens, or was it for worship on their own terms? I don't know, but... God is giving to Abraham all the things that they sought to establish for themselves. And was Abraham any better? No. And this is remarkable. Turn, if you would, to Joshua 24. Joshua is about to die. He's giving a parting sermon. And in it, he reminds the people of their history. With a word from the Lord, he says, beginning of verse 2, 24, Joshua 24, 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. God did not call Abram because Abram was righteous. You know, if you, if you keep reading, Joshua's whole point is that God has sovereignly acted in grace to deliver them at every turn. It says, Then I took your father Abram from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And I gave Esau the hill country of Seir. Jacob and his children, they went down to Egypt. And then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterward, I brought you out. It wasn't because Abram was righteous that God chose him. It's not, Isaiah is going to make this point later. It wasn't because Israel was more nu- the most numerous that God chose. In fact, they were the least. It was a nation of one man. God is manifesting his strength through weakness. So it's not because Abram was righteous. It's not because Abram was strong or rich or anything else. There's no more profound reason that God called than that God called Abram because God had set his love on Abram. God chose to. God is sovereign in his grace. Now we're going to explore the faith of Abraham beginning next week. Uh, This week, I just want to close by focusing on those promises to Abraham that were made here. I will show you a land, God says. Abraham clearly understood this to mean far more than the land of Canaan. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's partly because of something Paul says. It's partly because of something we read in the book of Hebrews. Paul understands these words to mean far more than I see them meaning. Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. He's right. I just don't see what he's picking up on. But he says, For the promise to Abram 
and to his offspring, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So, so Paul sees Abram as having been given a promise to be heir of the world. And likewise, the, the author of Hebrews tells us that Abram wasn't looking for physical geography. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So God promises Abraham heaven. And he promises Abraham descendants. Now later, that's going to be expanded on. Here, we're just told that he's going to be a great nation. Later, it's going to be specified that he's going to have so many descendants. They are as numerous as the stars of heaven or as the sand that's on the seashore. And we all know that everyone who shares the faith of Abraham are sons of Abraham. Paul says, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham in the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about the seed that of woman that would come to crush the seed of the serpent. Uh, that was the, the first declaration of the gospel. Uh, now it's confirmed and surpassed by this one. This is the foundational promise of the church. We are a nation. We are a priestly nation. We are a people made up of all people, a people with a purpose. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God promised Abraham a name. I'm going to make the mistake between Abram and Abraham. I'm sorry, just get used to it. God promised Abram a great name. Well, Jesus has the name above every name, and everyone will bow before that name. And every one of you who has been baptized into the one name of the Father, Son, and Spirit have that name. And you will be vindicated. Anyone who gives you so much as a cup of water because you love Jesus won't lose his reward. But if they don't, the Father won't be terribly pleased with them. So what's the takeaway? Well, I think it's that God is sovereign over our salvation and gracious in it. Our parents sinned in the garden. And our father, the father of our faith, Abraham, was an idolater. One lonesome idolater among a mass of fallen humanity, and God set his love on him and threw him on us all. He believed God, and all who follow him in that are blessed in him. Now, I take great hope in the fact that Abram wasn't perfect. Even this he was an idolater. It reminds me that there is nothing acceptable in me except that which God has given me. All that I have, he provided. He's the one who called me out of darkness. He's the one who's worthy of my praise. And he's worthy of my boast as I proclaim the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his glorious light. That's, that's the takeaway. Let's boast of the one who called us out of darkness. Let's bask in the, the light of righteousness and peace with God and, and spiritual wisdom and, and self-control. God loves you, and he is amazing in every way. He is holy, he is powerful, and he has set his love on you. Isn't that worthy of praise? Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, unless you had intervened in our lives, we would have gone the way of all mankind. We see our sinfulness before you. And we know that we have no righteousness of our own, but 
you've provided all that we need to stand in your presence, holy and righteous and good, spotless and without wrinkle. And you've promised to bless us. Whoever curses us, curses you. Whoever blesses us, blesses you. Even as you taught us in the day when you walked among us that whatever someone does or does not do for us, they do or do not do that for you. You have showered us with blessing. You've provided us with all that we need and taught us contentment in it. And, and you've given us a calling, Lord, to spread your fame and your worship throughout the world. So we ask that you would bless us in that calling. Make us willing. Give us opportunity. Guide our tongues and give us the words that we need. And be pleased to use our witness to, to draw others to yourself. There's many more brothers and sisters who've cast off sin to follow you. Glorify your name as you redeem the people and so transform us that your power and your mercy and your wisdom and gentleness and love would be evident to everyone through us. We ask these things for your glory, for our good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.